being a physicist from all objective point of views is a miserable career yes <laughs> and uh, i don't have to state the reasons the only reason it's worth doing is you just enjoy this you're obsessed by it you love what you're doing and so if you do it as a job it's going to be very very disappointing i think so don't underestimate yourself until <laughs> i went on this crazy adventure of uh Amanda and Ice Cube, I always live with the insecurity that I didn't belong to the circles I moved in, which I think must be true for almost every graduate student. Just get over that. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, it's not every day you get to talk to a hero of physics, of modern physics, someone whose roots go uh, go back quite a ways, someone who's been a leader in the field of, of astrophysics, of particle physics, who's an educator and a communicator of science, uh, but also who is actually, I think today's guest is my first ever guest who is a professor of mine, <laughs> although I took his class as an adjunct uh, student while I was at the University of Wisconsin, and it is one of my personal heroes. This is Francis Halsen, uh, who is a Belgian particle physicist, although he's been in America probably more than half his life. He's the uh, Hildale and Gregory Bright Distinguished Professor at the University of Ma Wisconsin Madison. He's a director of the Institute for Elementary Particle Physics, and he's the principal investigator of the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, which is operated at the South Pole, Antarctica, uh, since 2010. Before that, there was Amanda. Uh, Francis, it's a certain treat to be here, for me to host you here, rather. And I just hope you won't share the grade that I got in your club. Please don't <laughs> tell my audience. I don't want to... <laughs> I I don't think my bureaucracy, my administration is so good that I would be able to produce it. <laughs> uh, well, it was one of my favorite classes of all time. Not not to mention the fact that back then it was rare that professors wrote the textbook that was used for the class. I think I had that only with Leon Cooper at Brown um, with one of his quantum mechanics books. Um, but uh, but to take this course on uh, particle physics with you, and it was uh, it was such a treat. And I thought we'd start there, Francis. We always start. We have on you know we just had on Martin Rees, Lord Martin Rees, last week, and he uh, spoke about his book. And we always do a scenario called judging books by their covers, where we look at the cover <laughs> of your book and we judge it. And and how did you come up with the name? And hopefully entice you know a, a, a tenfold increase in book sales instantaneously. <laughs> so the book we're talking about is called uh, Quarks and Leptons. It was a wonderful, wonderful book that I uh, had there. We'll, we'll show it on the screen. It's written with uh, your co-author Alan Martin. Well, I don't recall uh, much about him, but but uh, certainly taking it from you was quite a treat. So Francis, can you help us judge Quarks and Leptons by its cover? How'd you come up with the title, the subtitle? and the cover illustration the title was actually first of all i must say this was a long time ago and that's the amazing thing about the book right people don't realize now that this book was written uh a long time ago and that the w the z the top quark none of these things the higgs none of these things had been discovered Mm -hmm. You know, like the whole book is kind of prediction of the standard model. And uh, in fact, it, I, the, the book was in print when the W was discovered at CERN, the weak intermediate boson. Wow. And uh, so the editor called me and said, you can still change things. You know, I've read a newspaper and I said, there's nothing to change. <laughs> and he was kind of uh, worried that he had been part of some huge gamble. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, the title is kind of embarrassing because although I think it was really, the books were really written in parallel, uh, Okun, famous Russian theorist right. wrote a book, Leptons and Quarks, that came out around the same time. So it's not that original. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the illustration that you have on the uh, cover, what does that represent? There's I, I, the only thing I remember is that I actually made it, <laughs> <laughs> and it remembers. You know, jets were something rather new then. Uh, you know, quark glue on jets, the yes. concept. And so I know that it represents like a jet made in deep in elastic scattering or something like that. Right. Uh, it's amazing that I cannot remember. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that rings true. And actually, we have had on past guest uh, Frank Wilczek uh, many times. And he he cites that the discovery of jets, at least not not by you know Ice Cube or anything personally, but he cites that as as the kind of signature achievement of of his career and of work that that yeah. uh, particle physics yeah. as a community has led to. Um, and I wonder, you know, if we could pivot from this wonderful book, which I learned a great deal from, and I still make reference from when I have uh, the the task of teaching to young people as well, as well as your style. So uh, I want to first take a step back. Uh, it is rumored that you knew Lemaitre, the famous uh, Belgian Catholic priest, the progenitor in some sense of the Big Bang. Is that true, Francis? I barely knew him. Uh, he, uh, he died when I was doing my undergraduate thesis. And so uh, I could tell the Maitre stories for a long time, but I'll only tell you two, uh, because of course ev every interaction I had with him is now legendary, <laughs> right? But I'll only tell you two. He had a computer he built himself to solve Friedman's equations, and it was a, a big room with vacuum tubes, and. That computer, I mean, it was state of the art at the time, was only used uh, during uh, the day. Mm -hmm. And we actually, we mean the, another graduate student and I, Remo Gastmans, we would actually break into the room and uh, use the computer at night. And we used it to calculate Feynman diagrams. Uh -huh. Feldman had just discovered the methods Right. To, 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 to calculate Feynman diagrams by computer. And so I think we may have been the first people to do this after, after Veltman discovered it. The other story is that, uh, when I, uh, I was, uh, an undergraduate, the Maitre would arrive in a limousine at the physics building. And, you know, he was an important person and right. he couldn't walk anymore, barely walk. And we put him on a chair and then carried him to his office on the second floor. <laughs> and it's only later that someone else who was part of the Institute told me that that was actually Le Maître. I had never made the association. Wow. He was not very visible. He was retired and... Uh, you know, he came in very rarely. And, and uh, by the way, mm -hmm. he was not famous, right? As you can imagine. Right. He not was that. famous for uh, being a cardinal and for his role, like, maybe his role in Vatican II, but I don't think so, actually. No. So he was, uh, I mean, you know, the, the status of cosmology at that time, right? right. So what? it was just at the time he died, as you know, when the microwave background was discovered. That's right. And one of the things that's always impressed me about him and many others is that he was an advocate that the Pope, uh, was it Gregory? I, I forget who it was in Vatican. But they they uh, attempted, the Vatican attempted to uh, utilize the you know predictions yeah. of the Big Bang, at least as a motivation for Genesis. And I, I was actually just in Galileo's uh, house in in Florence, Arcetri, Italy, and of course, you know he was refuted by the the Catholic Church and repudiated his own ideas under penalty of death, basically. But um, did you ever get the sense, or was there anything in the Belgian physics community, perhaps that uh, what that that you know spoke of what was his true you know um, emotional investment in the Big Bang? Did he have one, or was he able to detach being a no, scientist I, from being I, a I, theologian? Yeah, I cannot tell. I was not 
you know, he, I never got any class. He basically was at the end of his life. And so we had really no interactions scientifically with him. But yeah. the fact that he, uh, he denied that the Big Bang had any connections to creation, that's, I think, well documented. Mm -hmm. yeah you, know, you read this bio there are a couple of biographies of this which i've read of course and uh uh they, they they clearly document that he he didn't see he didn't make any connection to religion mm -hmm. and when we were getting ready to start recording today um i wanted to kind of get your you know take on the obligations of a scientist in terms of what he or she should do quote unquote should do uh and i think you know lamatra certainly took that role seriously but but you know he had so many hats that he was wearing you know pontifical hats maybe and <laughs> science hats but um but what's your philosophy we'll we'll come to more kind of big picture questions later um after we review ice cube and your career but um what is your view uh, of, of what the obligation if any that a scientist has to explain things to the public and then do they have to kind of be careful how they explain things because maybe the public doesn't understand what they're doing? Well, I think I, uh, from this point of view, I am a, a very pra practical person. I don't think I'm on a mission of anything. <laughs> and on the other hand, uh, I think that uh, given we are supported uh, by the public to do our science, we owe some return to them. And, you know, I have never turned an invitation you, to talk about my work to anyone. To, at any level, any student of any age, I always react positively to an invitation to discuss my work. And, and that's, I think, an obligation we have. Uh, beyond that, uh, I think it's very dangerous to, you know, our expertise is science, and it's actually, even within science, it's a very limited expertise. And I think it's uh, to the advantages of scientists that they stick to their expertise. <laughs> and that's certainly something I always do. Yeah, I always say that, you know, the, the problem that we are scientists deal with is that sometimes we become political scientists and yeah, we start exactly. to delve into politics. Uh, no, that's not a good idea. And it also, it hurts science, right? Because it then science begins to look like something that it shouldn't be, and it's not. Right. And there's a danger in what we call audience capture, that you have to um, only do what your audience wants you to do. So on this channel, a lot of times people <laughs> want me to only have people that won the Nobel Prize or only talk about aliens or only talk about dark matter. <laughs> and I have to be very careful because I get a lot of attention from the videos uh, that are popular, but that isn't necessarily the totality of what I think a scientist should be interested in. So anyway, I think you're absolutely right. And I want to ask you, um, you know, first, we can go back uh, to maybe a moment in your career that was a little bit, you know, maybe perilous. I remember being in, in Madison, as you know, from 97 till uh, Peter Timby, my my wonderful advisor, who's been a guest on the channel. So you're my second guest from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the great Badgers, uh, uh, cheese state, Dairyland state. Um, so uh, I had nothing but fond memories of being there. Uh, when I had Peter on, we were kind of, you know, speculating on on the the notion as a scientist to deal with uncertainty. And I remember you building, you preparing to build and, and starting to build up Amanda. And it wasn't just the technology. It wasn't just the theory. It wasn't just the science. It was the people. It was the team that you built, which is, you know, it, which is unrivaled. And so it seems to me you've been working on this for so long. Was there ever a time that you had doubts in yourself that the funding would come about, that you might not succeed as you've done so, so spectacularly well uh, with Ice Cube. Did you ever have a moment of panic uh, uh, that you just were so terrified the project might not move forward? The whole the whole story was a story of panic. You see, <laughs> you, you got the right word. Uh, you know, from the beginning, when uh, people thought that... Uh, 
this was a very cute idea, but that it wouldn't work. Well, that's what we thought too. <laughs> so, but it kind of started as a, you know, as a, a game. It didn't cost that much. We were piggybacking on the on the South Pole infrastructure that already existed to a large extent. Uh, but then NSF uh, started to fund the project. I actually borrowed a lot of money from the University of Wisconsin. And I was deep in debt to both NSF and the university. And we had never seen a neutrino, not an atmospheric neutrino. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, and of course, it's because... Uh, we really didn't know whether turning ice in a Sherenkov detector was possible. It took us like a decade to figure out what the ice was like. We couldn't put it in a test beam at Fermilab. And so, uh, you know, the most exciting, Im among all the panic moments, the most exciting moment was not when we discovered cosmic neutrinos, but when we finally observed atmospheric neutrinos, because that I felt we have delivered. Now it's up to nature. And even afterwards, I thought, you know, if a scientist, you know, the English like to gamble, right? Scientists wrote an article that gave us six to one to discover uh, cosmic neutrinos. <laughs> <laughs> against, of course. And uh, I remember not feeling very well <laughs> when I read this. But then uh, I, I always thought if we did build something that unusual, we'll do something interesting. The big surprise, actually, is that uh, we are doing neutrino astronomy and not something totally different. We do different things as well. But the other moment of panic is when we finally got the courage to publish in science that we had detected cosmic neutrinos. And weeks later, we were declared uh, breakthrough of the year in 2013. And I must say that uh, was also a moment of panic. And I remember the press conference and the only thing I told about is how do we run this backwards if this happens not to be true? <laughs> right. And, that and not I lived with that panic for quite a long time. In fact, it's only now that we see sources, right, since 2017, that, you know, I, I I sleep better at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, you know, 30 year journey to But this this was a wild ride, right? This whole story of ups and downs and yeah. So, um what was the role of the South Pole in in this? Could it have been done somewhere else? There there are alternative approaches, but none even closely related in success to what you've achieved. So no, there, that that was uh, it's a unique opportunity because you need clear eyes. Clear eyes exist elsewhere, but you have to build a sophisticated detector in a remote location, and without the South Pole stations, I mean you. This would not have been possible. Remember, we started in a very modest way and nobody would say, oh, there, by, we always wanted to build a kilometer cube detector. Can you imagine someone saying, ah, Halsen wants to build a kilometer cube detector. Let's build a station somewhere above the a glacier in Greenland and uh, give him the opportunity. It was pure serendipity that these two things came together, the clear eyes at the South Pole and and the station being there. Nobody would have built it for us. No, and it's such a unique location. I've been there twice. Uh, I, I actually prefer going to McMurdo than going to the South Pole, but that's just me. A lot of people love going to the South Pole more than anything. Uh, and the the results that you've garnered, yeah, it's it's it is serendipitous in a way, but it also took a lot of foresight by you and your team to recognize and persuade. I, I think one of the least appreciated aspects of a scientist is his or her ability to persuade. 
And that includes persuading an undergraduate to work in his or her lab or a funding agency or to get tenure or to get even a professor job. It's so hard nowadays, but then building a team. So it's it's not enough to have the right idea. Like the idea is just kind of the table stakes, you know, to use a gambling analogy. Um, so when when did the the kind of um, th- that that sub- subsiding of that panic, what has been, I mean, of all the things that Ice Cube does, and we're going to cover it a little bit of technical detail because my audience is the most sophisticated in the known regions of the multiverse that we inhabit. Um, but I want to ask you of, of the technical breakthroughs, could Ice Cube have been done, you know, 50 years ago, let's say if there was a, you know, very, very young uh, Francis Halsen as a, as a graduate student, could you have done it 50 years ago? Or were there technological breakthroughs that you and your colleagues and understanding of the ice has made? To enable yeah, ice uh, it depends. It's a difficult question. I It's a question I've never answered, which is rare. Uh, the, one of the challenges, I mean, maybe the biggest challenge was to build a hot water drill. And that was such an unusual problem. It was also an exciting problem because, you know, you don't go to school and they teach you about hot water drills, right? No. So, well, in Wisconsin, this, they do actually, right? Francis? This was done do. by a group in Wisconsin of engineers, professors, graduate student technicians, anyone who contri- could contribute, mm-hmm. contributed. And it was very exciting, but I think, you know, it's car wash heaters that make the power and the nozzle is very sophisticated. It was designed by an engineer, but it could have done, been done before, no mm-hmm. doubt about it. I am not so sure about uh, the data acquisition because, um, of course, we could have used the Amanda technique of of just sending analog signals over uh, the cable that brings down the high voltage, right? To, that powers the photomultipliers. So, but the the data acquisition of Ice Cube is a bit more sophisticated. You know, we capture the signals in uh, in the ice, transform them to digital, and then transmit them. And so that was, in fact, the chips that are used were the PhD thesis of a student of David Nygren hmm. at Berkeley. Oh, wow. So that was really a bit beyond state of the art at the time. Of course, now uh, that technology is is looks like archaeology, right? But uh, <laughs> this was uh, the the Berkeley design was made in um, in the late 1990s because mm. it was all in place when we submitted a proposal in 99. Right. Wow. So it could have been done it probably could have been done earlier, but in its present form and for the discoveries we make, the electronics, I don't think we could have done it with Amanda analog signals. Uh, uh, it's pretty essential to have the technology that uh, Nigran and the Berkeley group uh, developed for the data acquisition. I want to ask you, because I knew you as a as a student of yours, uh, albeit not as a graduate student, I think that would be a, a great treat. But um, but as a student in a class about uh, for advanced, you know, undergraduates and graduate students on particle physics, um, why do we conflate um, scientific ability with educational or pedagogy ability? In other words, um, you know, someone who's a pilot may be extremely skilled at flying, but we don't ask you know, him to like teach flying necessarily, although you, and you can actually teach flying with, I'm a pilot in my side hustle uh, to to pay the bills here at the State University of California. Uh, but I want to ask you, why is it that we do that? Do we, do, do they do that in Europe? Is, is that common, um, you know, that we have an expectation that because Francis or Brian are good at scientific research, that they're also good at teaching or, or is that a mistake? Well, I, this is one this is one of the things I feel passionately about and never had the time to do much about it. But I think that uh you know the graduate uh school 
that exist today at American universities uh, is, uh, in a sense, unfortunate. It still lives in the days that you take courses and learn all of physics and then do research. First of all, you cannot learn all of physics anymore. You cannot even learn all about some specialized subject in physics. No. So the way I have, I, I have everything I know, and the, the Belgian system at the time allowed you to do this. Everything I know, I've, I've learned by doing research. Mm. You get interested in a problem. You have to solve it. You learn everything you need to solve that problem. And that's how you learn. And you remember, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, that's the ideal way, that, you know, d trying to get a background of all of physics before you start doing research is an illusion, uh, which, we sh which we are still living in, in our present system of graduate schools. Yes, yes. And it's it seems to be, you know, sort of strange how the European system influenced the American system. You know, the, the uh, Germanic uh, kind of uh, emphasis on research. And now most of the Ludwig Boltzmann or, or Max, Max Planck Institute, they don't teach, as I understand it. So it's kind of ironic that the t educators of the American system, um, the, uh, they don't do any education of their own <laughs> anymore. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the technical details and the theoretical underpinnings of Ice Cube, and, and you've been kind enough to prepare some slides. So I'll let you get set up to share the screen. Okay. So, uh, you know, we want to detect uh, neutrinos from space because we want to do astronomy with neutrinos rather than with photons. And we know how to detect neutrinos. This is an experiment in Japan in a deep mine, and it's a huge tank of water and light sensors. And that's how you detect uh, neutrinos. The problem with this uh, beautiful experiment is that the theorists in their wisdom told us that, uh, and by the way, I'm not blaming anyone, <laughs> it was one of them, uh, told us that this experiment is 10,000 times too small to, to do astronomy and catch the tiny flux of uh, neutrinos that reach us from the universe. So, to make a long story short, we built a detector that uh, instead of water, made out of water, is made out of ice. Mm. And the phototubes are distributed throughout the ice. And uh, according to our wisdom, as theorists, it probably had a chance to detect cosmic neutrinos, but no guarantees were given. And so what you're looking at, of course, is uh, it's not a real picture. But so if you go under the South Pole, you stand, the South Pole station stands on three kilometers of ice. And you go one and a half kilometer deep, uh, there are strings with uh, the light sensors that you saw on the walls of the Japanese experiment. And so the strings are a kilometer long, and there are 86 of them. So the light sensors between strings are 17 meters apart, and the strings are uh, 125 meters apart. And 86 of these strings fill a volume of ice with uh, light sensors. This idea, by the way, was uh, born in 1960. A Russian physicist, Markov, came up with this idea. So the idea is certainly not new. So the challenge was to melt these uh, sensors into the ice. And so we developed, that was the, the, the first big challenge. We developed uh, technology at Wisconsin to do this. And the second challenge was, was this ice good enough to act as a particle detector? And that's a long story. And the story is told in this slide. And I would spend the rest of your time if I went through this slide. But we made our major breakthrough when we realize that the light, blue light in ice, travels over hundreds and sometimes hundreds of meters. 
So this is a uh, compacted snow of 70,000 years ago. It's ultra pure. And even in a lab, you cannot build a block that transparent to blue light. So that we didn't know that. That was pure serendipity. So these two things being solved, we built it and took data. And the idea is, you can imagine your block of ice here. And uh, you can imagine that it's like, one and a half kilometer deep, it's dark. So what we do is we look for particles coming through the earth and only a neutrino can come through the earth, nothing else. And that neutrino not only comes through the earth, it comes through your detector. But occasionally, like one in a million, will hit a nucleus in the ice, a nucleus of hydrogen or oxygen, and make particles. The particles it makes in the nuclear interaction, they are charged and they make the light glow. That's called Cherenkov radiation. And if this is a, a, a muon neutrino, then it makes a particle called the muon and it travels for uh, kilometers in the ice. So that muon uh, you can detect from... 50 meters to at high energy, 50 kilometers away. Uh, that's not quite practical, but you get the idea that your detector is, is bigger than what you instrument. And uh, the other thing is you have a telescope because you not only detect the muon, you can uh, point it back because the muon travels at a speed of light almost. Mm -hmm. And the light in in ice travels at three quarters of the speed of light. So it's like a speedboat that uh, outruns its waves. And so you get a shock wave, like the bow wave of a boat, and you can, and it points back where that muon comes from and where the neutrino comes from. Right. So we built a detector and here you see an event. This is a neutrino that comes 11 degrees below the horizon and streams through the detector. It deposits inside the detector 2,600 TeV of energy. So you must remember the highest energy beam at CERN in Geneva mm. is 14 TeV. So this particle deposits just inside the detector 2,600. And by the way, um, uh, I mentioned atmospheric neutrinos, which are background. This event is much too heavy to be produced in the atmosphere, much too mm. energetic. And we can do astronomy these days with about 0 0.3 degree resolution. If you didn't get a picture here, you see on mm. our online display, you see the muon going through the detector with the speed of light slowed down by the computer. And so that's the method. And so what we did is we measured neutrinos from the cosmos. And you see here, this is the energy that uh, the detector collect in neutrinos from the cosmos and as a function of the energy of the neutrinos. And the data points you are looking at are electron and tau neutrinos. And this actually is the flux of the muon neutrinos measured the the pink uh, band is the flux measured with the method I just displayed. The other data points we measure electron and tau neutrinos with a different method, but you see they agree. And uh, so this is the muon flux through the earth and you see how we measure the flux from the atmosphere when we reach the threshold of the detector, which is 100 GeV. Mm -hmm. Then we get more and more background in atmospheric neutrinos. And when we reach some place like tens of TeV, then you see the atmosphere turns off and we see the excess flux that was shown on the previous picture. This is a measurement now close to 10 sigma, and we have seen atmospheric neutrinos in at least four totally different ways. Mm. Uh, that's the status of Ice Cube. I have a few slides uh, to show what our results are, if uh, 
Yeah, please yeah. do. Please do. In fact, one our most important result, we actually never advertise, but I'll do today, and I, I always personally do. I showed you the flux from that we receive from the universe, the energy flux in neutrinos. It's what the astronomers call new F nu. And of course, uh, we receive, we detect fluxes of gamma rays. Here you see this peak, this huge peak, that's the CMB. Very familiar to my host. <laughs> and then you go through, it dominates the universe. Then you go to uh, different wavelengths of light. This is ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays. But then the universe turns opaque to gamma rays. They turns opaque to gamma rays because it cannot make they cannot make their way through the microwave background. The microwave background filled the universe stops them from reaching us except from our own galaxy. Right. And, and actually, uh, Francis, I have to stop you there. Yeah. Uh, did, go ahead. Did you know that the namesake of your professorship, Bright, the Bright Wheeler? phenomenon which is the interconversion of photons to to uh positron electron pairs that was only recently detected and um and actually i made a video about that i'll have a link to it in in here but uh okay, that was thank you yeah that was really exciting right anyway please go on yeah the pair production yeah. yep uh pair production so these photons uh pair produce make e plus e minus pairs interacting with the microwave photons and so they lose energy so the flux disappears and that of course is the raison d'etre of neutrino astronomy uh you see here once you are below beyond this demarcation line you can only do astronomy with neutrinos and uh but the other interesting thing is, if you look at the flux of the gamma rays, the flux in neutrinos we observe is actually larger than the flux in gamma rays. And nobody had ever expected that. And that's also why we found it with only two years of data. And uh, so this is an interesting fact, which uh, still requires some thought and explanation. Uh, so. Now we have to find where these neutrinos come from. So here is a picture of one year of neutrino data in galactic coordinates. So that's the sky. We see in neutrinos. We have 10 of these pictures for 10 years of data, more now. And we know from the flux we just measured that in this map, there are 138,000 plus atmospheric neutrinos, wow. 200 of them are actually cosmic. But you also saw what I explained. If you go to very high energy, the atmosphere cannot deliver neutrinos anymore, and you are in business. So if you look at the very highest energies, it looks like this. Uh, these are various methods with which we collect collected these cosmic neutrinos. But notice one thing. We don't see our own galaxy. Mm. Now, mm. in any other wavelength of light or any other way of doing astronomy, the first thing you see are the sources in your own galaxy. We don't see those. Uh, we see flux at the 10% level of the flux that reaches us from the cosmos. So there are galaxies outside our, or sources outside our own galaxy that overpower the flux from the nearby sources that produce neutrinos in our own galaxy. Uh, we have a paper that's on, on, uh, on the review in science that will address this question. Mm. Uh, but just to remind you, that's what uh, the galaxy looked like in visible light, and we don't see uh the galactic plane in neutrinos. Now, for many years, we made uh, the cosmic neutrinos were discovered in 2013. Of course, the game was where do these particles come from? You know, we know their direction now to 0.3 degrees. And we did all kinds of things 
but I'm going to just tell you about the latest. We we actually discovered the source in a multi messenger campaign in 2017. It was an active galaxy, and uh, I'm going to tell you what happened uh, since then. We collected. We looked at our 10 year map. And we published a paper a year ago, and you are looking what's in this paper. Uh, and forget the red, just look at the blue. The blue, this is uh, the upper limit on neutrino sources. We didn't see any by analyzing 10 years of data. Uh, and you see the dashed line is our sensitivity to sources as a function of where they are in the sky. The northern hemisphere is on the right, zero is the horizon, and uh, the left is the southern hemisphere. And we discovered, however, that our map after 10 years was not quite symmetric, isotropic anymore. And it was due to these four sources. Hmm that we detected at almost five sigma discovery. Yeah. But that's before the look elsewhere effect. After you imply the look elsewhere effect, the asymmetry in the map was still real, but the evidence for the source is not so great. Mm. Uh, NGC 1068 almost reached three sigma with all trials taken into account. So the question was, were these limits and fluctuations? And I'm not going to, I'll just give you the answer. They are not fluctuations. Uh, we went to a campaign to calibrate the detector better, to do improved uh, reconstructions using machine language. We improved the point spread function of the telescope, abandoning Gaussian approximations. And uh, with the conspiracy of all these improvements, we answered the question I just posed. And here you see NGC uh, 1068 before the improvements. And then you see we calibrated the detector better, in including calibrating each uh, phototube individually. And you see how. This is the source, the astronomical occasion. You see how the, with more statistics, we move towards the source. We, the, we point better at the source. And our final evidence is at a level of 4.2 sigma. Now, this is uh, the result of a blind analysis where we mathematically can compute all our trials. So this is a real, this is not a social construct, it's a real probability. And so I can sleep well at night <laughs> with 4.2 sigma. Uh, so here, another way of looking at it, this is a picture of NGC 1068. It has this very active hot gal uh, corona surrounding the central black hole. And here you see the simplest way to look at a signal. You see, this is the direction of uh, NGC 1068. The orange is our background by atmos from atmospheric neutrinos. And you see, if you approach the source, the number of neutrinos increases. So we see 88 neutrinos pointing at the source with on average higher energy than the energy of the background, which you cannot see on this picture. So that was certainly very exciting. Uh, here you see, let me just look at the, the top one. Uh, these are three analyses that confirm each other. They are slightly different. They actually use, assume different spectral indices. But you see here the five sigma discovery, which I showed before. And you see, this is pre-trial. You see NGC sticking out of it. You see a source TXS0506. That's the source we discovered in wow. 2017 because mm. it produced a neutrino of enormous energy that telescopes in a multi-messenger campaign pointed back at this source. And of source PKS 1424 plus 240. So the top three sources 
reappear with improved significant. Uh, interestingly, one of these sources here on the fourth row in this analysis is NGC 4151. So here we are, you know, in 1943, Seifer discovered uh, broad spectral lines from these two sources published in this paper. So uh, we reproduced these two sources in neutrinos. And now I could go forever on forever again. But so <laughs> we just, all these sources are sources that are actually uh, active in radio. So they have an active core and the core is opaque to gamma rays. So none of the stuff we see is accompanied by gamma rays. The gamma rays are shifted in the dense target that produces the neutrinos. They are shifted to MEV energy, X-ray or below. And so this is where we stand. So, in fact, this is multi-messenger astronomy plan B. Mm -hmm. How do you look for sources that don't emit gamma rays? That's not so simple, actually. <laughs> so I'm waiting for ideas. Yeah, I think that's the end of this. Yes, so this is a NASA picture of uh, NGC 1068. Yeah, sorry, this is it. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Francis. So um, the other thing I wanted to pivot to was a uh, recent paper that your team had in Nature about a limit on quantum gravity. And I wonder, first of all, do you have any slides about that? And it's fine. Yes, I do. Okay, great. You I do. And I, up? you know, mm -hmm. I want to emphasize that. Uh, we are about 350 people analyzing ice cube data. The, what I presented, the astronomy I presented, is probably only about one third of us are doing this. I don't know the exact number. But uh, people are using this detector, of course, to do glaciology. There mm -hmm. was a time in my life I published more glaciology papers than, uh, <laughs> than physics papers. I'm very proud of it. And uh, a large fraction is looking for dark matter. That has been a long haul. Amanda was actually originally very much motivated by the fact that we would have discovered dark matter if the WIMP miracle had happened. And unfortunately, it didn't. Yeah, so, that's right. Uh, but we are still looking. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> people use uh, the neutrinos to do tom tomography of the Earth, geology, okay. and it goes on and on. We do neutrino oscillations competing with Fermilab, uh, with a different part of the detector that I didn't emphasize here. But uh, one of the things we, all, we have been doing is, given the opportunity so unique, we have been looking for quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. And this is a very old story. Uh, there is actually a whole community in physics that uh, involves uh, looking for quantum gravity, which is kind of married to the alternative, which is looking for uh, violations of special relativity. It's uh, it's it's they are uh, in bed together, as you will see, but. It's easy to explain, you know, our neutrinos have a mass. We detect them f over cosmic distances with enormous energies compared to neutrinos we make at accelerators. So the fact that they have these tiny masses is very important for physics, but it's totally irrelevant here. The, our neutrinos are like photons. And so if they, they travel through the vacuum from the sources far away to here, and even though they have a flavor and oscillate into each other, by the time they arrive here, they arrive as packages of electron tau and mu neutrinos with equal, in equal numbers. So this is boring. Unless this thing happens and I wrote an article oh, two decades ago, and a German artist made this picture. 
And what does it show? Mm. Well, it shows what the vacuum that our neutrinos travel through looks like if uh, you marry quantum mechanics and gravity. And so if you meant to marry quantum mecha gravity and, and quantum mechanics and gravity, you know, the sheet that uh, matter transforms that Wheeler always talks about, that sheet now has quantum fluctuations. Yes. And so this is a picture of what a vacuum looks like, our, our daily vacuum we live in now, uh, what it looks like uh, when uh, it has quantum properties and quantum fluctuation, which it has ha does mm -hmm. have to have. The problem is that in our present vacuum we live in, they are suppressed by the Planck scale. So they are tiny. Mm. And if I transform the Planck scale in a distance, they are 10 to the minus 33 centimeter. So you need neutrinos or photons with wavelengths of that magnitude to become sensitive to these fluctuations. And we do. And we already were aware of this and set the first limits with Amanda. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you we want to go into that much yeah, detail, but we should. We I'll, should. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean the audience loves to hear so, the details. You all you how do we look for this? I mean clearly our experiment, you know, the is is ideal to look at these particles traveling through these fluct these quantum fluctuations over cosmic distances. That's how we get sensitivity. This effect is very small, but we can build it up by having the neutrinos travel for a very long way. And so what you basically do is uh you test whether the particle satisfied this, the, the classic special relativity dispersion relation, E square equal P square plus M square. And that's the property of these neutrinos when they travel through, in absence, through, through just vacuum. The M square doesn't really matter at our energy, but this relation between energy and momentum is modified when the neutrinos start to interact with the, they start to feel this quantum fluctuation. And that we parameterize as a, a power series, you know, a sum of n equal one, two, three, and so on, uh, a distortion in energy. That's characteristic of the Planck scale. So the quantum gravity scale or the scale of the violation of relativity, because you see E square not equal to P square can also be caused by violating special relativity. So we, we look for terms like that when the neutrinos propagate. And so. It's a few line calculation. So what, what actually happens? What happens is that, uh, particles with different energy now begin to propagate, violating to a different extent this E square, E square equal P square relation. And so the particles, uh, with high energy get a time delay. Uh, proportion to particles with lower energy. The ones with high energy interact more, so they get delayed. And the time delay is given by the power of the term you are investigating, this power series. Uh, you know, we typically look for uh, n equal two term. And then so we look for a term uh, of time delays that are proportional to the energy square. And so, but the time delay builds up the larger distance you look to the source. So even though this is very small effect, if you build it up over long enough distances, you can, can become observable. And it does in the case of ice cube. So as I, it says here, integrate over very long distances. So here is uh, an example of one version of this analysis. And uh, I always like to quote, to show it with a quote from Michael Turner, who said, 
that unlike Newtonian physics, general relativity will not last 200 years. So we're trying to prove him right. But you see here, we can put uh, limits of delta C over C, a change in speed of flight, or an influence of the gravitational field phi uh, on the propagation of the neutrinos. And you see, we sensitive to the variation of order 10 to the minus 28 when the coupling to the gravitational field is strong enough it's given by this angle which is i won't explain right. so you better so we are putting limits on violations of relativity of 10 to the minus 28 now if you listen to how to how i explain this so you have these wave packages of three flavors traveling through these quantum fluctuations. So the different flavors can go or undergo a phase shift when they interact with these gravitational fluctuations. And that creates uh, flavor oscillations made by the interaction with, the, with this field with this quantized field. And uh, that violates, can violate the prediction I made two minutes ago that we have pa wave package of equal flavor arriving. And so what IceCube now does is uh, it, uh, and that the paper we recently published was one version of this. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the number of uh, tau, mu and electron neutrinos in the beam. So we have to discover this red dot. If we are anywhere else in this plot, we have discovered something. Lorentz violation, quantum gravity. And you can it, interpret it any way you want. And so our present, this, uh, this red dot with our present measurements of the three flavor scenario as a systematic error, which is given by this, uh, by this butterfly. Mm. But so if we, we can establish, uh, violations of, uh, these principles, new, new physics, uh, by ending up somewhere, anywhere else in this diagram. And so this is our present measurement. This is the error bar at a 68% level. And we are doing a dedicated effort similar to, or even bigger, to what I explained for finding the sources of the cosmic neutrinos to squeeze these error bars. We are actually going to put in uh, new strings upgrading the detector in the season 20. 526, which among other things will exactly focus on making this a small ellipse around the red dot and hopefully maybe not. So mm. we will see. But this is a high priority of the experiment. I have two more slides to, to remind you of uh, uh, a fun fact. You may remember that the Opera experiment discover the violation of relativity many years ago. Now. Yeah, it was actually the year before yeah. the BICEP2 results came out, which made yeah. us very nervous <laughs> that we made a yeah. blunder. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you can see on this slide, there is another way to test relativity, which was pointed out by Glasho. That is, if uh, your particles move at a speed of light, C prime, which is bigger than the speed of light, they carry an excess energy, mc prime square minus mc square, and that extra energy they can radiate away. And uh, that radiation, for instance, can be come out as e plus e minus pairs. But when they radiate away their energy, it means they lose energy. And at the time, Glasho and, and Floyd Stecker pointed out that the highest energy neutrinos had actually too high energy and were inconsistent with the opera observation. 
Of course, I don't know whether the opera has <laughs> observation disappeared before the paper was published, but our highest energy events seen at the time were inconsistent with that violation of relativity. So it shows we are doing something real in, yeah. uh, in a very concrete uh, way, right? Uh, and uh, no, actually, yes, I, I didn't. Last I note. didn't know yeah. about that. And Sheldon, yeah. Sheldon was a guest on the podcast about two years ago, and I neglected to ask him about that event. Well, there's so much to talk to Sheldon about, as there is. Oh, with you. yeah. I <laughs> mean, how do you pick your subjects, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could go for hours. The, the only thing I want to yeah. say about the Lorentz invariance, and we're looking for it in the uh, polarization signals of distant objects as they rotate yes. or do not yes. rotate and you can look for uh birefringence yeah. types effects as, yeah. as you talked about with the yeah. ice um, by the way i you 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 know it's a clear quantum but what what i was explaining before is the analogous of gamma rays traveling to a crystal right and they yes. can exchange their polarizations That's there it. so it's a pure quantum effect but it's it's very straightforward to to look for it yeah, it's uh, very interesting. And I guess the only, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, critique that I've heard is that the results are somewhat model dependent. I mean, this this SME framework, which I've used in my papers before as well, yeah, is very, um, it's, it's very specific to a particular class of, you know, it's like they say about non-Gaussianity. It's like saying it's a non-dog animal. Well, there's a lot of non-dog animals in the world, right? So how do you well, address those, you know, kind well, of- Well, my answer is that uh, this is the least model dependent you can get, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a model, you can mm -hmm. always reinterpret it in terms of this power expansion. That's right. This is actually a standard method that was pioneered by Weinberg, right? Mm. To, to, you have a theory and you parameterize the deviations in terms of uh, operators with, of different dimensions and N are the dimension of these operators. That's amazing. Yeah. So I think that's the most model. So it's the most the model independent you yeah. can can get that and any model we can reinterpret in terms of these results that's right that's right um well th thank you so much for that francis i guess the um the topics i'd now like to turn to is uh what comes next uh for ice cube there's rumors of advanced ice cube um structure that will come about can you talk a little bit about the status of do you have any slides uh, on that or or no okay, uh i fine. uh I don't have any slides on that. That's fine, yeah. Uh, so I, but it's very simple. I mean, if I had given a one hour talk, and I, I often do on Ice Cube, the only conclusion any reasonable listener can come to is we need better angular resolution. We need more statistics. We just don't want to deal with a few sources. We need more sources. Yeah. And what do you do? You have to build a bigger detector. Yes. Fortunately, we discovered when we build and design, when we build Ice Cube, we only had a vague understanding of how large the absorption length actually was. Hmm. Because Amanda was much smaller, right? So we had never seen ice and light propagate in ice over kilometer distance, right. which was necessary to measure an absorption length, which at the bottom of the detector is 250 meter for hmm. shrink of hmm. light. So it's just incredible. And uh, so we were conservative, but now we know we can space our photomultipliers further and so this 125 meter distance between strings of photomultipliers we're going to increase to 250 meters and then we can instrument eight to ten times the volume with the same number of photomultipliers wow so ten times the volume for the price of uh ice cube and uh, of course, uh, you know, all the, the 
data acquisition, which I discussed at the beginning, all that is uh, improved and uh, much cheaper. And so we really think we can build a next generation detector for the same cost uh, as as the original one. We actually have all we have designed this detector uh, and submitted the design to the decadal review who endorsed it. So it's not uh, a dream anymore. No, and at, a... le at least unlike the first dream, at this point, we know what we're doing. <laughs> it's not a gamble <laughs> anymore. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, congratulations with that. And of course, you know, it's just a phenomenal treat to see not only the success of your projects and uh, the leaders under your leadership, but all the young people that have come out of it. Uh, my friend, Nathan Whitehorn at, at UCLA. Yeah. And, and of course, sharing the the space with you and, and, and your team down at the South Pole um, with uh, 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 so many young people. It's always so energizing to be down there and not to mention the hot tubs uh, which were which were quite great. I never got to go swimming in one of the hot tubs. Though, yeah, I I always show a picture of the collaboration at the end of my talk. Yeah, but it's actually a picture, and it's incredible the age of our collaboration. I have theories why this is, but I won't go into <laughs> that. It doesn't matter. The but, other thing I have yeah. to say is, and this was always emphasized by Tre the late Trevor Weeks, who discovered, uh, who, who developed uh, gamma ray astronomy, Earth-based gamma ray astronomy. Trevor Weeks used to say, astronomy is not like particle physics. You need many telescopes. It's not like discovering the Higgs. You know, in principle, one detector right. could maybe have done it, but you need two. Even there, you need two. And so astronomy, uh, the sky is big. There are many problems. So with a smaller telescope and the right idea, you can contribute. Yes. And so people picked, I think the, the, the biggest compliment to Ice Cube is that people are now planning and building detectors, building in Lake Baikal, building in the Mediterranean, building in off the coast of Vancouver in uh, Canada and planning a detector uh, in uh, in China. Yeah. So no, there are many and many more to come, I hope. It's truly uh, breathtaking and inspiring to me as one of the uh, five or so co-leaders of the Simons Observatory, uh, which is equally sized and is also hoping to shed some light, no pun intended, on neutrinos and uh, their yes, role as dark matter and and as uh, uh, a very important budget uh, and energy budget constituent in the cosmos. So, Francis, we speak we speak a lot on this channel to young people, graduate students, postdocs, undergraduates. And uh, one of the favorite parts of the show is when I ask kind of non-scientific questions, which I call the existential questions or the final four. And I'd be honored if you'd answer uh, some of them, if, if you don't mind right now. I am fearless, but <laughs> I okay. am... Uh... I'm probably not a, a good or certainly not a typical subject for this, but let's go. <laughs> There's no typical subject. So, yes, let's go into the impossible, the final four questions I ask. Uh, so they, they typically have to do with the distant future of both yourself and uh, and of humanity, perhaps. And then uh, advice to your former self as a young person, because as I said, we have a lot of uh, mostly men. I'm trying to boost that up, but uh, mostly young men interested in science and technology. Uh, but we are um, we are open for all. So the very first question that I always ask is, what would you put in what's called your ethical will? In other words, what would you like to to impart as wisdom that you've learned? Not scientific necessarily. It could be anything. It could be to your children, um, or great, you know, grandchildren, or many, many generations down the line. What piece of wisdom guides you, if any? Well, I I think with the advantage of not just looking at the future but looking back, uh, I want to come back to my years that I was at Le Maitre's Institute writing my undergraduate thesis on quarks. And imagine, this was 1967, 8, 1967, actually. Mm. Uh, and uh, so 
I alluded to the fact that if you worked on cosmology at the time, you were kind of a crackpot, right? <laughs> uh, yes. Le Maître was not a famous person except for the fact he was a cardinal. Right. And he had been, uh, you know, the president of the Papal Academy and so. Uh, but I actually, my undergraduate thesis was on quarks, another topic that nobody would touch at the time. Right. And so first of all, the, the first message is just do what you're interested in. You cannot be successful if you do physics as a job. And I, I'm kind of at the edge of the generation where actually physics wasn't a job. And that was wonderful. Oh. Uh, I'm afraid to say the time yeah. is gone and it's rightly gone. Yeah, but well. uh, the, So that's one message. The other message is how to, you know, I don't have to predict or be a visionary. Look how exciting science is. Can you imagine that in 67 you worked on quarks and jets and uh, on uh, cosmology and the Big Bang? You were not taken seriously. In fact, you couldn't get a job, even if it was a job. <laughs> and uh, look where we are now. I mean, the, a black hole and the Big Bang and a quark jet are as real as this cup of coffee on my desk, right? Nobody questions this anymore. And right. this happens in my career in, in one generation of, of a physicist. Wow. And I have no doubt that this will continue. Mm -hmm. yeah, it may not continue in the direction that we are now talking about. It may be off in a different direction, but I'm sure it will continue. Science will always be exciting. Yes, absolutely. It's the, uh, it's uh, as you'll hear in just a second. I'll say what uh, my next <clears throat> my next quote comes from Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, and I want to ask you, what knowledge, either from your personal career or from all of science, or maybe, I don't know, anything from philosophy, theology, who knows, what piece of, of one sentence or the shortest amount of words that you could possibly describe the thing that humanity should be most proud of? Well, I as I always limit myself to the expertise I have, and uh, not just humanity. My generation should be proud of what we just talked about, yeah. and that's something to be very proud of. I think. I agree. Yeah, my late great colleague uh, Hans Parr. Did you ever know Hans? Did you? Ever yes. Know him? Yes. Yes. So he yeah. was. Uh, he was a great influence on me. He said that. Uh, yeah. The general relativity, which is part of uh, some of what we've talked about, uh, was the pinnacle, not of just science, but of all of Western civilization. <laughs> uh, and so I agree, yeah. a lot had to go into that. You had to have uh, cooperation, language, there's a beauty, there's artistry, and there's also a hard technology. And the most important thing, which you keep emphasizing so rightfully, is people and the culture of yes. an experiment is so important. Okay. And uh, and people who are really obsessed with what they are doing, those are the ones you are looking for. That's right. Yeah. Um, next question, before the second to last question, is another quote from Sir Arthur C. Clarke. And he said, when a distinguished but elderly scientist says that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. But when he states something is impossible, he is probably wrong. So I want to ask you, Francis, what have you been wrong about, if anything? Oh, many, many things. Uh, in fact, uh, let's go back to my my career. Career was half uh, astro particle physics and half particle physics. Right, I lived around accelerators and uh i wrote when we were writing halsen and martin uh i i actually 
gave Halton and Martin originated because I took a semester leave at the University of Hawaii because I was working with Pan, uh, Sandy Pagvasa. By the way, that was the time they were developing Dumant. And I had no idea what Dumant was, but I'm sure it's stuck in my brain somewhere. <laughs> uh, but at the time, they asked me to give a course. And they say, you just come and talk what you did the last week. <laughs> and I thought, I walked into the room and the whole faculty showed up. Wow. And so I decided the, the set, the C0, had just been discovered, the weak intermediate boson. And I talked the first lecture about what a breakthrough this was. And, and so then I actually decided over the semester to to develop what we now recognize as the sta standard model as lectures. Mm -hmm. And so that was the beginning of Halsen and Martin. Uh, so I think uh, I never, there's something called the gym mechanism. And I couldn't believe that you could just invent another quark to fix a, a deep problem of the theory. And I thought that was incredibly naive. And it turned out to be right. And I remember going through this history of me being wrong, not believing the gym mechanism. You know, the gym mechanism fixed the standard model with postulating that there, there was a charm quark in the theory. Right. And so it made a big impression on me in the sense that uh, you know, sometimes sim you you shouldn't hold it against simple ideas. <laughs> you, the simpler an idea, the more elegant. This was, in a sense, elegant. And I, I, my my reaction was totally wrong. That something simple cannot be right in nature. Mm. That simple. And so I learned a lot from that. It made a big impression on me too, because uh, you know I. I, uh, it doesn't feel good being totally wrong about something. <laughs> no, absolutely not. But I think the mark of a good scientist is to recognize, learn from it, yeah. uh, own up. And, and I, I learned my lesson from that. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And I, you know, I never have, uh, unless something can, is demonstrably wrong, I have very, I accept everything. <laughs> Basically, I mean, if uh, you you have to have a very open mind when you approach a problem, it's not good to be biased. That's what the yeah. thing I learned here. Yeah. Well, that really does dovetail into the last question, which is uh, from Arthur C. Clarke's third law, which states the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way into the impossible. And maybe I'll pivot because you've you've said so much about you know kind of advice to your former self. Maybe if you were getting into this career or in any kind of career, you're 20 years old, you're at the University of Wisconsin Madison, you're at UC San Diego or wherever. Well, what would you go into? What would you advise a young Francis Halsen to go go and do to do as you've done to go into the impossible? I all already gave the answer to yeah. that. You go what you're interested in, unless you're obsessed by the subject. I mean, being a physicist, from all objective point of views, is a miserable career. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I don't have to state the reasons. The only reason it's worth doing is you just enjoy this. You're obsessed by it. You love what you're doing. And so if you do it as a job, it's going to be very, very disappointing, I think. So I, I think this, this is just, and the other thing is, uh, you know, I always lived with, uh, don't underestimate yourself. I totally lived with until <laughs> I went on this crazy adventure of, uh, Amanda and Ice Cube, I always live with the insecurity that I didn't belong to the circles I moved in, which I think must be true for almost every graduate student. Just get over that. Mm. And uh, I don't know how to do this. I never did it until, you know, you go on a, 
on a wild ride like we did with neutrino astronomy then you just you know surfing the waves right but uh, of, at many yeah. times of my career i think i missed opportunities because i was insecure and uh so you, you know it's it are not always the smart people who make the breakthroughs <laughs> that's another way that's a very parochial way of thinking about it <laughs> well uh, yeah. you know imagination can trump intelligence there there are many angles to doing research yeah. uh, and so just go for it it's a uh, very very uh wonderful that you say that and we'll close with this um so when i interviewed barry barish two or three years ago now for this podcast i asked him that same kind of a question uh in the form of have you ever experienced the imposter syndrome which is this feeling of insecurity yeah. that you just spoke about yeah. and he said um uh yes i have it worse than ever now I said, yeah. what are you talking about you have the nobel yeah. prize he said no 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 brian when you win a nobel prize you have to uh go and sign this log book in sweden that <laughs> says that i got my nobel prize so Barry's incredibly curious, very imaginative, and he goes back and he looks through the previous pages and he sees he sees Feynman and he sees a uh, gal man uh, at his uh, alma, at his home institution of Caltech and then he goes farther back he sees uh, Maria Gephardt Mayer maybe here at San Diego and then he goes back to 1922 and sees Albert Einstein he sees <laughs> <laughs> this guy's signature here, my favorite little uh, sock puppet. And he says, I'm not worthy. I'm not as smart as Einstein. And I say, Barry, guess what? You know, Einstein had the imposter syndrome. You know, he wasn't always yeah, Einstein. Exactly. He said, what are you talking about? He said, Einstein felt that Newton did more for the human culture and civilization than any person before or since. And he said, wow, I didn't know that. And I said, Barry, guess what? It gets better. Newton had the imposter syndrome. He's like, ah, you got to be kidding me. He said, I said, no, Barry, Isaac Newton wrote, uh, he said, I live in shame that I never lived up to the ideals of Jesus Christ. So we all have our imposter, you know, kind of moments when we feel we're inadequate. And then, and then he on, ended up uh, writing, I don't know if you can read this, but I'll send you a copy of this book uh, next time I'm out there. But Barry wrote the uh, forward to my second book which has his interview yeah, in it. And I hope someday that I, I actually read it either on your web page or somewhere. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, so. I don't think it's unusual. I think it's also, I don't think it's a problem. It's only a problem when it prevents you from doing things. That's right. That's exactly right. And I think you're that, right to have the courage yeah. and just, as you said, just yeah. do it. Well, Francis, you've been an inspiration to me as a scientist, as a teacher, as a leader and as an author <laughs> and i'm just so glad and honored and thrilled that you were able to spend so much of your valuable time with us thank you so much i hope we can see each other again maybe you'll come here in january and i'll go there in june my and we'll go and get some cheese curds on the capitol together it was a pleasure